Good evening and welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church. I am so glad that you are joining us for our service, and I thank you for being present. Tonight we enter into a very powerful and moving worship experience where we hear about our Lord's commandment to love others as he has loved us. And then as a part of the service, we strip the pyramids from our altar and from our pulpit and from our lectern, symbolic of our Lord being abandoned by all. Then tomorrow night on Good Friday, we gather in worship for our Tenebrae service, which will begin at 7 o'clock p.m. I hope that you will be with us for the reading of the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and as the story of his sacrifice and death is told for all the world to hear. That service as well will be live streamed, a video for us to watch, and so I hope, as I said, that you will be with us. During that service, I also want you to watch as the church grows dim, as the life seeps from our Lord's body, as he is hanging from the cross. For so it was in the world on that Friday. As Jesus died, the world went dark. And then please don't forget that we will be celebrating the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Sunday morning with two services. The first begins at 8 o'clock in the morning. The second service begins at 10 o'clock. The music for our 8 o'clock service will be provided by soloist. At our 10 o'clock service, we will have our chancel choir and a string quartet providing the music for us. The 10 o'clock service will also be live streamed over our YouTube channel. I pray that you will join us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, would you join me in prayer as we come together in worship on this Monday Thursday. Eternal God, in the sharing of a meal, your Son established a new covenant for all people. And in the washing of feet, He showed us the dignity of service. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these signs of our life in faith may speak again to our hearts, feed our spirit and refresh our bodies. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. reading for Monday Thursday is taken from the 12th chapter of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. 
for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. John, the 13th chapter. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. 
Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. For by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Here ends the reading of our gospel for this Monday, Thursday service. Grace to you and peace tonight from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of you who are joining us tonight, you can remember Hurricane Hugo. At the time, it was one of the largest and the most expensive hurricanes to ever make landfall in South Carolina. The devastation that it brought was extraordinary. The storm surge in some places exceeded 20 feet high. It was a frightening storm to go through. I did not live in Charleston at that time, but some of you were here. And many of you remember the storm as if it was yesterday because it still haunts you. And no one that I have ever spoken to about Hugo wants to go through another one. When I arrived as the pastor here at St. John's, even though it had been 14 years since Hugo had visited Charleston, memories of that storm were still fresh in many people's minds. And they remembered the winds, the rain, the flooding, their houses shaking, boats being strewn all over the town. And they remembered what it was like when the eye of the storm passed over them. September 22nd, 1989, at midnight, the storm hit Sullivan's Island. It was like being in a combat zone. And then the eye of the storm passed over. And for a moment, there was calm, a slight breeze, clear skies. But people here knew what was still to come. Because what they had experienced, they were about to experience again. Because the other side of the storm was coming upon them. There was nowhere to go now. And there was nowhere to hide. Most who survived the storm were very quick to point out they never wanted to ride out another storm like that one. I bring up this story and this memory because Jesus and the disciples are in the midst of a terrible storm. The tide of evil has turned against them. The surge of angry authorities has swelled. Perhaps even the tree out of which the cross will be made is at this very moment being cut down. There is a saying that describes situations like this one. All hell is about to break loose. And certainly, the demonic is about to raise all of its forces against Jesus in the hopes that they can snuff him out. So the devil will be able to claim God's children and take control of God's creation. The lesson that Penny read to you tonight is the story of the Passover the festival celebrating the occasion where God rescued His children, the Israelites, from their slavery in Egypt. It was the blood of a sacrificial lamb marked on the doorpost 
and on the lintel of people's homes that caused the spirit of death to literally pass over the houses of God's children. It was this saving action of God in the history of the nation of Israel that they were now to remember and celebrate every year from that point on. Celebrating the Passover festival is one of the reasons Jesus ventured into Jerusalem. The storm surrounding Jesus has been forming, but it is in Jerusalem at the time of the Passover when it will make landfall. And again, as they say, all hell will break loose. I want you to picture this with me, if you could. I want you to picture the scene that is being rolled out before us. John is describing it for us. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He and his disciples are gathered in an upper room. They are there to celebrate the Passover. There is tension outside in the streets as talk of who this Jesus is and what he is doing is filling and occupying the minds of all the people outside, as well as the minds of the religious authorities and of the government. But there is also tension in the room where they are. We know Judas is contemplating what he is going to do. And what Jesus is about to do will make up the decision for Judas. Judas, you see, has longed for, he wants, he needs Jesus to rise up and lead an army of whomever and whatever against the occupying Roman forces. Judas wants a rebellion. And ultimately, he will get his rebellion, but it will not be the one he wants. We tend to forget that on the way to Jerusalem, the disciples got into an argument. We need to remember that if we want to understand this gospel. Do you remember what the issue was? Do you remember what the disciples were arguing about? These poor, uneducated disciples were arguing about who was going to be the greatest when Jesus comes into his kingdom. Who is it that's going to be first? Who is going to get to sit at the right hand of the Lord? Who will have the ear of the Christ, and who might the angels wait upon and serve when that day comes. It's not a pretty picture, no matter how da Vinci painted the scene. All the disciples were not smiling that night for this photograph. They're wondering, how is it that they will be repaid? for following Jesus. After all, discipleship, that ought to get you something, right? That's what a lot of people think. And not just something, but it ought to get you something great. Prosperity, special recognition, a seat at the table, a vote on God's plan. These emotions are just the kind of motivation and thoughts that the devil, Satan himself, is able to use against us and against God as well. And that is why I think Jesus looks around at his disciples and he realizes something needs to be done, something to show them that being in the world is not the same 
as being of the world. So what can he do? A lecture? Another teaching? Probably wouldn't help. So what's the Savior of the world supposed to do to change our minds, to change the way that we see each other, to alter the way we follow and understand discipleship of Jesus Christ. So, Jesus sees there's something very simple that needs to be done, something that a servant would do. At that time, they lived in a filthy world, mud, dust, raw sewage in the streets. They don't wear ankle-high hiking boots, but a very thin strap of leather, keeping their feet from the filth and the disease of the streets. So custom always dictated that a basin filled with water, a towel, a loincloth, be kept near the door, the entrance into a home. Enter the house, take off your dirty sandals, have your feet bathed, by a servant or by the host so that you are clean and you can enter the home. But tonight, there was no servant. And none of the disciples who have been vying, fighting, arguing for prestige are going to bend down and wash someone else's feet. Because for them to do so would certainly mean that they are not the first in line. They are not the highest among the twelve, but perhaps they would be the lowest. And that's why this story is so very powerful, so beautiful. Jesus himself, the Son of God, the one on whom the angels waited, strips down so that he can put on that loincloth. And he takes that water-filled basin and the towel, and he proceeds to wash the feet of the disciples. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, washes the feet of disciples who don't yet understand what faith-filled servanthood is all about. In the midst of a terrible storm bearing down on him, the talk and the plots that go from the temple to the governor's palace to the soldiers' headquarters, even the disciples' quest for their own greatness. The storm is bearing down and Jesus brings into that storm, a sense of calm. He writes their sinking ship. He demonstrates and shows them what it means literally to follow him. To follow is to know the gospel. It is to know God's love. It is to recognize that we are not called hold power or court over each other, but rather to love and serve one another. I I suspect Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, I suspect that's what threw Judas over the edge. Nobody who is willing to wash feet and serve others could really be the Messiah, could they? No one who bends down to clean filth and sewage can be the Son of God, right? And it is those thoughts that send Judas off to sell out Jesus to the Jewish authorities. But it is in this calm moment with the disciples, 
in a peaceful eye to their storm that we can see the real focus of our Lord's purpose. Just as during the eye of Hugo, you could look up and you could see the heavens, the stars. Now in the upper room, with Jesus on his knees, bathing feet, we look in upon that scene and we're able to see the glory of God's plan. Jesus certainly has come into the world to, to reveal God's love for us, absolutely. He has come to give us a new command that we love each other positively. He walked among us sharing with us a vision that God cared when for millennia humanity believed that God was too far off to care. Now let's go back to Jesus washing the disciples' feet. This is a powerful picture of what it means to serve other people, no matter who we are, no matter who they are. But it's a picture of something even larger than that. You know, it's the picture of what we all need to be bathed and washed clean of the filth that our sins and our life have covered us in. And it is in the person and purpose of Jesus Christ that we are bathed and made clean. Each and every sin, every prejudice, every evil thought, the bad deeds we do, the good deeds we didn't do, the denials of Christ that we utter in our hearts and in our minds, all are covering us in the filth of our sinfulness. In the calm of a coming storm, and of a moment alone with his disciples. Now before us, in the scriptures, Jesus points us towards the beauty of the heavens above, the wonder of the love of God, and towards what might be possible for us as modern-day disciples. In the power of Jesus Christ, and with the presence of God's Holy Spirit, we are washed clean so that we can love one another as Christ loved us, sacrificially. The storm that is swirling around Jesus this week is ultimately the storm where all hell breaks loose, where Jesus defeats every demon, the devil, and death itself. We too must go through this storm with Jesus if we want to emerge also with him from the empty tomb. But tonight, tonight, let's rest for a moment in the calm of this storm but still recognize we need to be getting prepared for what is coming. As was once said by a commentator of years gone by, let us be prepared for the rest of the story. The storm is coming, but soon, very soon, Christ will calm the waves and the wind of the storm before us. Amen.
tonight for our order of confession. As we go through that, I will speak each petition, and then I will leave a period of silence for you to repeat that petition from your home as you are worshiping with us. So let us now come before God as we confess our sinfulness. Let us make confession to God. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and penitent sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have offended you and for which I justly deserve your punishment. But I am sorry for them, and I repent of them, and pray for your boundless mercy. For the sake of the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, Be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Forgive my sins. Give me your Holy Spirit for the amendment of my sinful life. And bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for us, and for His sake forgives us all our sins. Through His Holy Spirit, He cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of God, who called us out of darkness into the splendor of His light. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore declare to you, the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, for a brief moment we are resting in the eye of the coming storm. Judas has now made his decision. The authorities are gathering to arrest Jesus. The crowds are feeling the uneasiness of indecision. Who is Jesus? Can He be the one they have waited for? But we know, God, Jesus is your Son. He is the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior. He has come to take away the filth of our sin and bathe us in your love and forgiveness. He is among us to bring us closer to you. He is the one who takes upon himself the penalty for our sin. He pays our debt, even dying for us, so that we might live. And tonight, before the storm closes in on him and on us, he gives us a new commandment, that we would love each other as he has loved us. Help us, God, to know your love and to share it with others. We pray, Almighty God, for your help to withstand the winds of the coming storm, to be strong enough to stand at the foot of the cross and proclaim, yes, I am one of his followers. We pray to be faithful enough to wait for as long as it takes until the resurrected Christ returns to us. We pray, dear God, to rest confident in a faith that knows Jesus as Lord. And now, gracious God, we pray this night for all who have need. We pray for the sick, the wounded, the hurting, the lonely and lost, those who need to be loved, those who feel as if they are unlovable. We pray for everyone with need, everyone to be touched by your hand, so they may be made whole and know your presence. And now let us join our voices 
as together we lift before you the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
cords of death entangled me, the grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent, I was brought very low and he helped me. Turn again to your rest, O oh my soul, for the Lord has treated you well. Child of your handmaid, you have freed me from my bond. 